All right, it's happening again. The Zoom room is filling up for another edition of Football Letter Live. As always, oh, look at Kevin Lashane. Is our, he's already beating us to it by putting his name in the chat and where he's from. Again, the Aiken Augusta chapter is well represented by, by Kevin. Everyone follow Kevin's lead and tell us who you are and where you're from and your Penn State class year and where you're tuning in from to watch tonight's episode of Football Letter Live. This is welcome. This is, I'm sorry, week six of Football Letter Live. And tonight we're going to spotlight Penn Staters who pump up the crowd during the football games and year-round athletic and campus events, the Nittany Lion and the Mike Men. Let us know again where you're from and where you're watching. If you have a question for one of our guests tonight, you could drop that right there in the Q&A tab. We will be getting started in just a minute as we let the Zoom room fill up. I see Steve Wagman from Bluebell, class of 82. Yay. Steve, good to see you. And Thomas Smith, another regular from Western Michigan. Russ from the Omaha Lincoln chapter. Russ, good to see you. I just drove through Lincoln, Nebraska, I want to say a week and a half ago. And so it was, uh, I was thinking about the time that we all went uh, to get barbecue when I came and visited out there. So good to see you on here. Mark Johnson from Myrtle Beach, Darlene from Warminster. Again, another great crowd tuning in for Football Letter Live. We'll be getting started in just a minute. We have a great show tonight with former Mike Men and Nittany Lions. They are going to take you behind the scenes on what it's like to fulfill those two important roles here at Penn State. Where else would you rather be than a Zoom full of Penn Staters? I'm Paul Clifford, CEO of the Penn State Alumni Association. Welcome to Football Letter Live right here Thursday night at our usual time slot, 8 o'clock. Tonight we are spotlighting Penn Staters who pump up the crowd during football games and at year-round athletic and campus events, the Nittany Lion and the Mike Man. We'll have some great Penn State stories. Uh, we're encouraging you to share your favorite moments with both the Nittany Lion and Mike Mann from over the years. You can do so by, um, you can do so in the Zoom chat or right on Facebook Live. Welcome to our audience who are tuning in there on Facebook Live. As always for this session, live closed captions are available for this event. You can access them by clicking the closed caption button at the bottom of the Zoom video window and then clicking show subtitle. You can also customize your caption experience by clicking the stream the text link that is posted in the chat box. Tonight, I'm joined as always by legendary editor of the football letter, John Black. Good evening, John. Good evening, Paul. Great to be here again. I'm, uh, I'm excited. I don't know that we're gonna be able to contain the energy of our guests tonight. Uh -huh, I don't think so, I don't think so. Again, we're encouraging you to share questions for our hosts and guests. You can do that using the Q&A feature in the Zoom toolbar or in the comment section on Facebook. So John, let's turn to some college football news. Penn State, again, has not played a game yet and we have gone up in the polls, now number nine in the country. Unbelievable. Right. It certainly is. It certainly is, Paul. At, uh... we that, but that's crazy this year. Some teams have played uh, three or four games already. And none of the Big Ten teams uh, will be playing for another two weeks. So uh, that's just the way it is. And, of course, the, the Pac-12 just announced that they will be starting their season on November 7th, uh, a seven-game season. So uh, I don't know how they're going to sort out the polls here at the end of the year. But 
It'll happen somehow or other. It's, it's funny, John, to think that we could come to the end of the season, have multiple unbeaten teams, maybe some uh, unbeaten teams from the same conference. Like when you think of the Pac-12 and uh, playing a seven-game season, all the teams aren't going to play each other. So it's possible that two of them could finish undefeated. Same can right. happen. Uh, same can happen in the Big Ten, where there's mm-hmm. two undefeated teams. Although, um, although the Big Ten championship game would likely take care of, likely yeah. take care of that scenario. Surely. Surely. Um, but but already but, but already with the uh, conferences that are playing, you've had a lot of upsets. Uh, you know, some of the look at the Big Twelve. Uh, perennial powers uh, Oklahoma and Texas already suffered uh, significant losses. Uh, LSU and Auburn in uh, the SEC. Uh, so it's it's going to be a mishmash this this year. It's hard to see how everything's going to shake out. In the big yeah, ten, so, of some course. of those games have some of those upsets have been uh, unbelievable. I watched the Ohio, I watched the Iowa State, Iowa and State Oklahoma, Oklahoma game State. the other night. Yeah, or Oklahoma. I'm sorry. Yeah, Iowa State. Yeah, Oklahoma. and uh, what I thought at the end of the game, it was at Iowa State. It was a big win, maybe right. the first time in a couple decades that they have beaten Oklahoma. Mm-hmm. And I thought for a second there, how are they going to keep the fans off the field, right? Because <laughs> Because they have fans that are there and yes, they did. Were socially distant throughout the game and all wearing masks, but a big win like that, and there's going to be a celebration. And I was, uh, I was a little surprised, but really encouraged that the fans kind of stayed in the stands and celebrated in, I guess, 2020 fashion and, and uh, being socially distant. Right. And uh, some Big Ten news, uh, Penn State's First game, of course, will be at Indiana, and Indiana just confirmed today that uh, they will they have lost two of their major defensive backs. Uh, the cornerback uh, Marcelino, Marcelino Ball, uh, who was probably their best secondary performer last year, is out for the season with uh, a knee injury, and uh, another safety uh, is uh, will be injured at least for the Penn State game at this point. So. Uh, Things are happening, unfortunately, just in, in practice for some schools. Yeah. Yeah, it's going to be interesting to see how injuries, right? I mean, you would imagine with the start and stop of preseason and um, in some cases maybe a shortened preseason to get ready and to get in physical condition, right. if we'll see more injuries, if we'll see the impact of COVID-19 and how that will take players on and off the field. So Certainly, certainly. Well, another 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 yeah. news item. Uh, the Big Ten announced uh, the men's hockey's uh, schedule for this year. Men's uh, hockey in the Big Ten will begin on November 13th. Each team will play a 24 uh, game season, and uh, then have an additional four games against Arizona State University, which is coming up to all the Big Ten uh, venues. And playing four games against each Big Ten team to uh, give them a, 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 a hockey s- schedule this, this winter. Uh, the, the NCAA, uh, excuse me, the, the tournament at the end of the year uh, will be uh, March 18th to 20th and will be a single elimination tournament. I'm sorry, that is the NCAA tournament, yes. Right. March 18th to 20th and just a single elimination. So it, uh, will be an abbreviated tournament too. But that's the hockey news. Yeah, it'll, it'll be really interesting. You know, we've seen the meteoric rise of Penn State, um, Penn State ice hockey uh, rising to now a perennial uh, top 10, top 15 team year in and year out. Uh, right. But it's also been interesting to watch how Arizona State has, um, has built their program and emerged as a, as a national power. And think about recruiting kids out of Canada to go play hockey there in Phoenix. I mean, (laughs) (laughs) uh, what a competitive advantage they would have from a recruiting standpoint with the great weather out there. Yeah. Uh, They, uh, in the days of club hockey, they they always had an outstanding team. They were one of the major competitors with Penn State and Joe Batista uh, when he was coach of our club hockey teams uh, that uh, advised for national championships uh, almost every year. John, have you seen the phenomena going around the nation for uh, some of these schools that um, are not letting fans into the stadium or limited number of fans where there's cardboard cutouts? Oh, yes, absolutely. (laughs) 
those have been very, those have been a lot of fun to see. Uh, and, and Penn State's getting into that game now. I believe they just announced earlier this week the opportunity for our fans to purchase a cardboard cutout so that you too can be in Beaver Stadium this year, or at least a cardboard cutout of you can be in the stadium. Right. And uh, Mel is dropping some information about that. If you're interested in a cardboard cutout of yourself in Beaver Stadium this year, you can follow the information that is in the chat box and go ahead and purchase uh, your virtual seat right. in, in Beaver Stadium this year. You John, can have one the of the virtual fun- Valley experience. The virtual Valley experience. One of the funny things I saw, and I'm trying to, I've been racking my brain to see what school it was, but one of the schools that was featured this weekend on one of the, on one of the TV games, their opposing fans bought a whole bunch yes. of virtual signs. Did you see that? I didn't, I did not see it, but I heard about it. Yes. No. So I, I want to say it was, uh, I don't I could be wrong, but I want to say it was Duke and Carolina. So right. Duke fans bought a lot of virtual uh, cardboard cutouts in Carolina stadium. And so okay. what did Carolina do? They put them where they put the visiting teams and sat them up in the upper deck. <laughs> so there's a whole bunch of Duke fans. I, I believe those are the two schools uh-huh. sitting up in the, in the upper deck. So uh, still fun rivalry things going on uh, in uh, 2020 COVID-19 college football. Right. Well, we have some great guests joining us this evening. Why don't we welcome them into the program? Uh, we have first up, he is the most recent uh, graduate on the panel tonight. He is a 2020 grad. Uh, he's the former Nittany Lion, a graduate of College of IST. Welcome Zach Soa. To the program. Also go. joining us is Francis Alvare. Francis was the Mike Man 2017 grad from the College of Ag Sciences. We'll bring in a, another Nittany Lion, Jack Davis. Jack was a 2017 grad, Smeal College of Business. Uh, welcome, Jack. Good to see you. Uh, Eugene Bowden. Eugene is the former Mike man and the current assistant cheer coach. He's a 24, uh, 2014 College of HHD graduate. And then rounding out our guest this evening is Chuck Kimball. Chuck was uh, former Nittany Lion 2001, 2002, uh, or 2000, 2001, and he's a 2002 right. graduate, uh, Smeal College of Business. What's going on, guys? How are we doing? Hey, Paul, great to see you, John. Great to see you as well. Good to see you, everybody. Thank you for having us. Uh, Thank you for the reunion. It's going to be a lot of fun, a lot of of shenanigans, (laughs) I'm sure. Zach, let's start right, so you're right in the middle of my screen. Um, Talk about uh, your decision to come to Penn State, and was part of that decision to eventually try to become the Nittany Lion, or was that something that emerged while while you were on campus. So was, was the lion in my head as part of my decision to come to Penn State? Absolutely not, because I had no idea that it was, um, that it was at all achievable. When I did decide to come to Penn State, I knew that I'd eventually try out because I knew anybody could, but yeah, did not have a clue that it was <laughs> a possibility. Um, but I, I grew up in a Penn State family. My parents met at Penn State, so I loved going to Penn State games as a kid, and obviously when I had the opportunity to come to Penn State, it was a pretty easy decision. You're the, I think you're the tallest Nittany Lion we've ever had, weren't you, Zach? Tied. Oh, tied, yes. <laughs> <laughs> tied for the tallest uh, Nittany Lion. Zach, uh, let's just let's stick with that for one second then. If it wasn't if it wasn't in your mind, it was certainly in your heart somewhere and somebody kind of unlocked that passion. How did you become the Nittany Lion? Well, um, as I said, I knew eventually I would try out. Um, but then in the spring of my freshman year, I caught wind that somebody was graduating, Jack Davis, also on this call. And the first thing that went through my head is, oh, no, I am not prepared <laughs> because one of the requirements to try out is you have to be able to do 51 armed push-ups, and that's consecutive on a single arm 
<laughs> and so the first thing I did when I got back to my dorm that day was I went and I was like, all right, let's gauge where I'm at. Right. I did one and then I did the down portion of the second. <laughs> I was like, oh boy, we got <laughs> uh, But yeah, I mean, I, I worked really hard till, till my tryout day. Um, Jack, Eugene, and Chuck were actually on the selection committee um, for, for my tryout. And yeah, I mean, I squeaked out the 50. I had a very interesting tryout. <laughs> I don't know how I got selected, but I did. And I worked the next three years to, to try and earn it because I didn't feel like I had it in the tryout. <laughs> we're going we're gonna to come back to one-arm push-ups, I'm sure, at some point, because I want to uh, I at least chide you a little bit about the Maryland game where we dropped 70 on them and, uh, <laughs> and, and how much fun that was doing, uh, what, 10,000 push-ups that game. Uh, but, Jack, how, yeah. about, how about you? Um, we know that you served uh, as, as a mentor to Zach uh, when, when, when Zach eventually became the Lion. But how about your path to becoming the Nittany Lion? Yeah, so it, it's actually eerily similar uh, to Zach's in that even my parents met at a Penn State football game, uh, Penn State Notre Dame. And I grew up, my mom grew up in State College, grew up a Penn State fan. Never thought the Nittany Lion was achievable. Um, I was a wrestling was my main sport uh, growing up and there's no way they're letting me on the Penn State wrestling team. Um, so then I came just attended as many events as I could. Thought the Lion had the coolest job, but not something that I could do. Um, then I, I was being a college student, a uh, little irresponsible and decided I was going to teach myself to do a backflip one day. Um, and when I to, to my surprise, uh, came out of that healthy and landed on my feet. I started looking into what, what does it actually take to be the Nittany Lion? Is, is that an option? Um, and realized I had about seven months to work hard and that it was an open tryout. Um, that was something I could achieve. So not something I envisioned coming to Penn State, but at the same time, really a dream come true when it happened. So we also have a couple Mike men on the program with us. We don't want to give them uh, any less attention than we give the Nittany Lion. We know everyone loves the Nittany Lion, but 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 every great Nittany Lion needs a hype man like right. like the Mike man. Uh, Francis, let's let's go to you. What is it like to stand in the middle of the field at Beaver Stadium and ask that question? Uh, well, I'll say the very first time it was actually uh, pretty intimidating. I'm not gonna lie. Um, it is, uh, it's a feeling that you definitely like makes your, your hair stand on end, um, gives you goosebumps for sure. And I'm sure each of these, these uh, former Lions can, uh, can resonate with that when they went to the 50 yard line and, and they get the crowd roaring. But uh, it slowly uh, becomes less nerves and more excitement and the excitement kind of outweighs the nerves and then eventually it just gets to uh, being, you know, the highlight of your entire week. Uh, and that's, that's the kind of stuff that really makes, makes you happy, um, where, you know, you can add to that atmosphere. Uh, you can help get the crowd going um, and get everybody fired up for when the team comes running out of the tunnel. That's the kind of stuff that, you know, I grew up getting excited for, um, and it only gets better um, when you can be the guy to get everyone going, what pictures you have? My, <laughs> these are good. <laughs> I haven't seen some of these. That last one that was up there, that was a Big Ten championship game. If you remember that, we were in the big convention hall there in Indianapolis. Indianapolis. And, uh, yep, I very much remember that one well. I knew exactly where that came from. <laughs> and those things that you're throwing there, they were heavy, if you remember. Like You, you have to be paying attention because you don't want to get hit in the head with one of those things. Oh yeah, they they were they were specific audience members that were calling for them that were getting those those foam hands. Yeah. But these kind of pictures point out that uh, you Lions and Mike Men perform just as much at the away games as you do at home games out there with uh, the alumni association uh, alumni events on Friday nights before a game and at the big pep rally uh, before the game itself. And uh, you guys are a big part of the, those activities as well. And really, 
in some ways, the uh, local alumni who don't get to see every game in Beaver Stadium, they're more excited uh, than the people who are there every time, uh, you know, than the season ticket holders at home. When, you, when we come to their territory, they're loving uh, the things that you guys do and that, that our pep band does and the uh, cheerleaders and the, the, whole, the whole gang that puts on a great show for our alumni at uh, remote locations. Eugene, you had the opportunity to also stand in the middle of the field and ask the are you ready for Penn State football question. Where did that come from? How did that, how did that originate? How did that become part of the tradition at Penn State? Well, actually, um, the Mike men's that were either before me or me starting into that season, we actually used to say, are you ready to rock and roll so that's what we we normally said and then you know i guess just with you know marketing and you know sports media we just kind of switched over to the are you ready for penn state football was that about the same time that the band changed the tune that they were playing coming into the stadium because i know that that has changed a little bit that is the exact same time that it did change that uh the saying did change that is correct yes Absolutely. Well, you're, you have, um, you have now also, you're an assistant coach, right? And so you have become um, a mentor to, to some of the, some of these guys. What has it been, what has it been like to make that transition from, from Mike man to coach and, uh, and, and do you hold them to a higher standard? Like how do you make sure that that level of excellence is maintained from when you had it to handing it down to Francis and, and now, uh, and, and all subsequent uh, Mike men, like Eric, who, who does it now. Yeah, well, actually, I'm a little bit jealous because, man, the Mike men now get so much pub- pub- publicity. Yeah. Right. <laughs> They're having the best of times, you know, you know starting that team run on on, Cur- on Curtin uh, Road where we have those pep rallies and, you know, just all sorts of events that they're doing. It's, it's truly amazing. So to see them do that, you know, I'm like, man, I kind of wish we had that when I was in school, but I will say it's been a great pleasure to see all these athletes who are the Mike men, you know, kind of grow into their own, find their tone, their voice, you know, their personality in the microphone. Cause I stated before, you know, you're, each person's different. Everyone has different types of personalities. So just to see how Mike men's changed throughout each year has been great. And it's been a pleasure of mine to help them and kind of guide them to find their own voice. So it's been a truly an amazing um, opportunity for me. So one of the things that I've learned uh, since my time coming to Penn State is that there is such a strong connection between um, between all the folks who have been in this role or in these roles, right? I met Chuck Kimball and Chuck let me peek behind the curtain a little bit as he talked about the fraternity of all former Nittany Lions. Uh, there's, uh, well, I, I guess I won't give any of the secrets away about how you all stay in touch with each other. But Chuck, talk about how uh, your experience as a Nittany Lion, how did you become a Nittany Lion and kind of the fraternity of Nittany Lions that, is, that are now out there? Yeah, yeah, sure. So my pathway to becoming a Nittany Lion was a lot like Jack's um, in that when I when I came onto campus, it wasn't I didn't know coming onto campus that I wanted to do it. But somewhere subconsciously, the pride of Penn State was kind of buried there. So wrestling was my bread and butter sport in high school. I was good enough to maybe barely walk on, but certainly not be a four year starter. And so I was kind of just exploring things on my cam- on the campus as to, you know, where I was going to kind of fit in. And the more I went to events, whether it was sports or, you know, alumni, student council, I would see the lion show up and I would watch the line. And I kept thinking, I bet I can do that. So uh, one day I ran into a friend of mine who was a uh, Penn State cheerleader. And I asked her all about it because I know the cheerleading team is very closely tied uh, to the lion. And she said, well, you could try out, but you can't try out this year. It's not an option because it's typically a two-year position, although in Zach's case, it was three. Uh, But since it wasn't open for tryout, she said, you should really come try out for cheerleading. I think you would really like it. And I said, "Uh, let me think about it, get back to you, okay. 
And uh, so I went to try out for cheerleading and that's where I had really gotten close to the current Nittany Lion mascot at that time, who was Marty Duff. And then in addition, learned how to do the backflip. And then once I understood that the, uh, the trial for the lion involved 50 one-arm push-ups, I was in a very similar situation to Zach, although I think I could do maybe two or three coming in. <laughs> <laughs> and, your arms, and your arms are a little shorter than Zach's, too, Chuck. Yes, so that's right. true. That's true. Physi right physics is on my side for the backflip, for the push-ups. That's right. I think they're a little bigger as well as shorter. Well, it's just, it's, it's just like the camera crunches it down. You can't tell. So, um, so then when Marty was graduating, you know, I, I kind of knew what it would take to try out. I put the tryout together, and I was uh, extremely, extremely blessed that, that – I was chosen to don the suit for two years. And, uh, it's been a privilege and an honor of, uh, of my lifetime, for sure. Well, you know, I've always had a soft spot in my heart for uh, Chuck Kimball because he was a lion, as you said, in uh, 2000 and 2001, two years back to back. And he's one of the very few lions that never had a chance to go in a, to a bowl game in a Nittany Lion suit. He uh, those two years uh, were Penn State's first back-to-back -back losing seasons in 70 years, going way back to uh, 1931 and 1932. And in the meantime, there were long strings of, you know, when Penn State went to a bowl game every single year, uh, all except two years out of the first uh, 24 that I was writing the football letter, we went to a bowl game. Yeah, so the Nittany Lion always got that year-end uh, year uh, privilege. And I just always felt sorry for, for Chuck because of the timing. Actually, actually uh, it was really a tragedy uh, that prevented that from happening in 2001 because 9-11 happened uh, during the second week of the football season when we were scheduled to play right. down at Virginia. Well, of course, that game was canceled, and uh, it was reinstated at the very end of the season, December 1st. And Penn State, at that point, uh, they had beaten Ohio State in an exciting game in the middle of the season. But uh, we went into Virginia at the end of the year with a 5-5 record. Uh, we were favored, but uh, there were some controversial calls on the field down there that uh, went uh, the way of the Cavaliers. They wound up beating us 20 to 14 and sitting up in the press box right near me were scouts from several bowl games that were all ready to present a bid to the Nittany Lions after their expected win in that game. And of course that, that wiped out. There went Chuck's chance to ever be a Nittany Lion in a bowl game. So I always, always had that soft spot for you, Chuck. I appreciate that, John. So he, John brought up 9-11. Uh, uh, as everyone knows, the Nittany Lion mascot always runs the very typical Nittany Lion flag. Right. Um, if you ever see, if anyone ever sees a picture where there's an American flag, uh, that would have been the September 22nd game at home against Wisconsin. It was the very first game after 9-11. Um, and it was, uh, it was an extremely concerning time for a lot of people just due to the fact that we were going to have a crowd of that size in one place. But I actually have that flag right here. So my grandfather, my grandfather Kimball, uh, was a World War II vet, and so th this was his flag that was laid across his casket uh, when he passed away uh, shortly prior uh, to that year. And so this is this is the actual flag that you would see in those pictures. So I had wow. even though even though I didn't have a bowl game, I had some extremely memorable moments and. Uh, I had a lot of extra pressure on me too. It's a little harder to be the lion when you're uh, when you're down a couple touchdowns. Yeah. Right? <laughs> Abs absolutely. <laughs> Chuck, you know, uh, let's stick with you for one second because you remember you mentioned the memorable moments, right? Uh, you mentioned 9/11, but I also saw that there was a picture of you wearing the number 43. And boy, you know, I don't know that we noted. I don't know that we noted this in our. Um, in our discussion when we were preparing for this episode, uh, but it is 20 years to the day that Adam Talaferro was injured at Ohio State. And um, so I'm, I'm assuming you were wearing the number 43 in honor of uh, 
in honor of a classmate and in honor of uh, Adam. This is the actual jersey right here. Wow. So Brad Caldwell, he's all otherwise known as Spider. 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 Right. Right. So Spider was the equipment manager for Penn State for years. Um, Spider, if you're on here, I love you, buddy. Um, he used to facilitate a lot of the equipment. And there's, there's the picture right there. I, I don't have it on in that one. I, I wasn't going to compete with Adam. That was the moment when Adam ran out of the tunnel um, against Miami, 8 p.m. under the lights in 2001. Um, he, he was originally scheduled to walk out of the tunnel, as everyone probably remembers, and the walk became a skip, became a little bit of a run, and he's coming right for me. In Adam's, uh, in Adam's words, the Nittany line was actually his target. But he's running dead straight at me, and he comes out and gives me a hug. And um, when you have things like 9-11 like and, and Adam's story, uh, realistically speaking, it really puts the wins and losses into perspective, especially considering these are college kids. This is college football. This is not professional. And so um, while we didn't go to a bowl game, I would say that they were, uh, they were perspective, perspective games for sure. Absolutely. Hey, a uh, couple questions coming in from folks in the audience. Let's do a couple quick hitters because some of you might know this. Um, the oldest living Nittany Lion mascot. Uh, who's the oldest living uh, Nittany Lion as, to date? Mm. Chuck, Chuck, I was hoping Chuck? you'd be quick with that one. <laughs> <laughs> I was hoping you were going to be quick with that one. Uh, yeah, I can't remember because we just lost our the two oldest in the past did. what year? Like, yeah, in the past year we lost the two oldest. Um, so I don't know who it is now. All right, we're going to get our crack research crew on that, which <laughs> really means Chuck, just look it up, and, uh, <laughs> and we'll come back to you. <laughs> we'll come back to you with the with the answer for that. Does anyone know which Nittany Lion? So I don't know the the really the and origin Durant. of this question. Which Nittany Lion has done the most push-ups? So oh. either in in a game or in a season. I mean, I would have go ahead. I. Uh, Let's start with the game. I don't know totals for seasons, but Tim Durant in, uh, I think, 91 had to do all the push-ups for uh, the Cincinnati game when we beat them 81-0. Yeah. to 80, zero. Right, 81 to nothing. Uh, <laughs> so I, I remember. think that equated to somewhere in the 500s um, because I know when we scored 79 against Idaho, I had to do in the 400s, but as I answered in, in the Q&A section there, I faked it on my way to 79 because I learned my lesson against Maryland. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, and you know real quick, just to, just to throw this out there, when, when we hear numbers like 400s and 500s, when the Lion has their big his big football Saturday, there's a president's tailgate in the morning, then there's some type of alumni tailgate after that where the, you do probably 50 and then another 50. So typically 100 before you even walk into the stadium. The stadium. And then... And then it's really the sum total cumulative effect because you're going to do seven and then maybe a field goal, you'll do 10. And then a touchdown, you'll do 17. And when you start adding those up, you can go home at night. And if you're not ambidextrous and I'm not, you're going to have one side that's very <laughs> sore. <laughs> and Chuck, what, what I remember is going into those road games um, before we're on stage with John Black and Francis was my mic man. And I remember kind of negotiating with Francis <laughs> what, what number we're going to do. So we might have an eight-game winning streak against a team, but we've won 54 games overall. So Francis thinks we, we need to do 54 to celebrate every <laughs> single win that we've had in our history. Um, do, doesn't seem quite necessary. And, you know, you can negotiate all you want, but at the end of the day, you get off on that stage, you can't talk. And uh, the mic man has a microphone, so you kind of got to do whatever he puts That's on That's right. Plate. And I used to do 43 for Adam all the time. And people used to say, doesn't it stink? His number is 43. And I said, hey, it could have been 75. Yeah, not <laughs> yeah. the worst. It's not the worst. Yeah. Hey, yeah, you mentioned... I was also lying while, while Francis was my man for a little bit, and I always used to joke with him. That, well, he used to joke with me, actually, that I better stay on his good side or else he's going to give me those higher numbers. Yeah. You know, you mentioned Tim Durant, and I think it was Tim Durant uh, was a Nittany Lion because I believe it was 1991. 
because that's the year that the uh, upper deck on the north end zone was erected. We had a new uh, deck for 10,000 fans there in the north end zone. And he pulled one of the greatest stunts I've ever seen, the Nittany Lion. You know, we all see the Nittany Lion being passed up and down in the stands in the student section and maybe running up and down uh, some aisles in, in the alumni section. But I, as I say, I think this was Tim. I, I can't be sure. But Don, it was me. I, I remember the event when at halftime, he got up and he uh, ran around the concourse level and oh. then up the ramp into this new upper deck. Then, uh, and then he ran up the middle aisle in the new upper deck to the very top. Wow. He grabbed a hold of the wall at the top middle of the upper deck. He climbed up over and disappeared on the backside. And the gas, you know, came out of the entire stadium. They thought he had fallen off the end. Oh. About 10 seconds later, you see this lion paw reaching back up over the wall, and then another paw, and then he climbs back over in a big victory formation, you know, and, and a, just a sigh of relief <laughs> almost sucked all the air out of the stadium at that point. But the secret was on the back side of that wall was a platform for the television cameras that are up there to shoot the high end zone shots for this TV. And man, I mean, that, that was a, the most, uh, that was the neatest uh, Nittany Lion stunt I can ever recall in Beaver Stadium. But he, he ran back down to the, uh, you know, cloud, the crowd went wild, you know, cheering for him. Unfortunately, the uh, alumni, I mean, excuse me, the athletic office decided that was not a good thing to do. <laughs> they didn't want to risk losing the lion or having a new you know, multiple heart attacks take place among the fans in the stadium. So that was outlawed after that. Risk, risk management has, uh, has <laughs> foiled it again. I know uh, some of the guys out here have had some run-ins with our risk management department. We're not going to go into that um, at all tonight. We're going to avoid that uh, conversation. But let's go around the horn here. Eugene, when your time as a mic man, what was your favorite moment? My favorite moment, you know, I never got to do a bowl game as a Mike man either. So I would honestly say it was the whiteout against Michigan where we had the four overtimes. Ah, yep. Just to be in front of that crowd and that sea of white and in front of uh, the students, you know, to have that connection with them, you know, right before the game and to get them going was just truly remarkable. So I would honestly say that was my – my highlight of my Mike Man career. <laughs> How about you, Jack? Yeah, that's, that's funny Eugene says that because that was my freshman year, my first whiteout game ever. Um, and, you know, Eugene was big man on campus when I was just a freshman. Uh, so <laughs> now, now, now just getting to talk with him on Zoom is a big deal. Um, so <laughs> I, I was very fortunate. I remember for football um, – I would talk to former Lions who had been to the Rose Bowl and things like that. And I, I couldn't imagine what it was like during kind of Penn State's heyday to be the Lion. Um, my junior year, my first game ever, we lost to Temple. Um, and and I, I was ready to give up the position. I, I didn't think, uh, yeah, it was too great. And then uh, my senior year was the year um, we lost to Pitt, lost to Michigan, had the great comeback against Minnesota, ended up in the Rose Bowl. Um, but despite saying that, um, and as much as that was something I never dreamed of, and it was an incredible week, um, for me, I, it always comes back to Thon. Um, those events that have more meaning in the Penn State Dance Marathon, which um, supports families who have a child battling cancer. Um, the meaning behind that, like Chuck mentioned, the, the sports are wins and losses, but um, there, there's so much more there and I, I don't want to steal Zach's thunder because Zach took it to the next level after me. Um, but I'll say that, that when you, you were playing with those kids and those families, uh, how much that means. Um, and, and on a lighter note, one of my favorite events I did um, that's a little smaller and people might not know about, there was a season ticket holder event for wrestling. Um, 
and I got to wrestle Kale Sanderson. And I, I don't <laughs> think he knew that I had any background. Um, we, we did a game. You got to get an anklet off the other guy. And I got his off first before he uh, really turned up the heat and got two of mine off. And I, I lost. He had me upside down. But as oh, a former wrestler, gosh. that was a dream come true. All right. I thought he was uh, – I thought – I thought you were going to tell me he wasn't undefeated anymore. <laughs> no. no. <laughs> the, the, the Nittany Lion doesn't lose a lot, but against Kale. That's funny. Francis, how about for you? Um, I'll start out with, uh, yeah, my first year um, as Mike Mann started out, you know, with Jack in, his, in our senior year, I, I took kind of a victory lap there with an extra semester. So I had, I had two senior years, but the first one being that incredible season where, you know, we were on the verge of tears, basically walking out of Heinz Field. Um, and yeah. then, you know, and then we, we go to Michigan and you, you just think all hope is lost. But, you know, Jack actually looked at me and he's like, we're not done. We're not done. No, no, no. We're not done. He's like, and so we, we turned, to, turned the season around. And I think the culmination of that, that it's hard to choose that season. Um, but I, I would have to say, you know, having 10,000 people in the street between Staples Center and L.A. Live no. uh, and shutting down like four city blocks in L.A. and just wall-to-wall people was pretty electric. Um, you know, it, it, getting up on stage, I saw the crowd building when we, when we first got there, but I didn't quite get to take in the magnitude of it because I didn't get to get up on stage until that one point. But I think mm-hmm. you know, when, when you're looking out and, and it's just wall to wall Penn Staters in a city that's about 2000 miles away from where we're supposed to be, then, you know, that, that is, that was the most electric thing for me. Um, as far as my favorite memory, however, I'm just going to cherry pick off of Jack and, uh, and Zach as well, uh, coming up, but it's, it's Don, um, hands down. My favorite memories were the two Don pep rallies that I got to lead. There's well, 10,000 people in the street of LA screaming over Penn state going to the Rose bowl when we should have been dead meat about two months ago, uh, was electric. Don with 17,000 students in the arena, plus probably about, you know, a thousand or so family members of uh, Don children and, you know, 700 and some odd dancers that are on the floor. There's nothing like looking out and seeing a little Don child's face as they're sitting on the shoulders of one of the football players who's standing in front of the stage. And you get to see that and see how, the impact that you make on their life uh, for, you know, the, the cumulative 30 seconds that I had the microphone of 46 hours. Uh, that is still my favorite memory to this day. And it's my favorite Penn state memory from my entire four and a half years. Yeah. All of, all of you guys spent much more time uh, representing Penn state at uh, not, uh, events other than football than you did in a whole season of football. Yeah. No. Yeah, that's correct. Um, Francis, I was, uh, I'll never forget the night we played the Staples Center. That was amazing. <laughs> yeah, that was, that was epic. Uh, Zach, I, I, I'm going to guess maybe Thon, but I'm going to let you tell your story. How did you know? <laughs> <laughs> um, yeah, definitely, definitely Thon. Um, everybody else has, has touched on it, but um, I'll, I'll summarize this kind of in my own way. Um, my time as a lion, I always did it with this kind of act of like service in mind. Um, I wanted to make the biggest impact I could on the community in anything that I did. Um, and Thon was, in my view, the best possible way to do that. It allowed for the greatest impact. It was so tangible. Like the, the kids you interact with and their families, like you could tell that it just meant the world to them. Um, so yeah, it really... I mean, my senior year, I, I completed my Lion career uh, at Thon, and I knew that I wanted to do that ever since my freshman year, or not my, my first year as a Lion, <laughs> which is basically the beginning for me. Um, but yeah, it, it, Thon is, it, it's miles above the rest just because of the impact that you're able to have. And I was lucky enough to dance in Thon and raise over $50,000 with the Mike man, Eric Gaspich, um, 
just the two of us for, for my senior year, my last event ever as a Lion. Absolutely. Chuck, you have had the opportunity to be part of um, selecting future Lions. You've been there for tryouts. Talk a little bit about that uh, tryout process and, uh, and, and kind of what that looks like for, for Nittany Lions. Sure, sure. So, um, yeah, uh, Zach had mentioned earlier, I think he was being a little um, uh, self-deprecatory there when he was talking about how he didn't know how he was selected. <laughs> uh, no need for the self-deprecation. That, uh, that tryout was well-earned, even if he didn't understand what the tangibles and the intangibles were at that time of his tryout, which there's no way you could when you're a freshman trying out for something like well earned. Um, and so it is a combination of completing the criteria, because there is standard criteria, you might have to do a two minute skit, we'll throw you something, you have to improv with it, 51 arm push ups, you can throw the backflip if you want, if you do it, and you land it, it's bonus, but it will not prevent you from getting the position, but it certainly will be a few points added. What a lot of people don't know is that they're the night, the day before the physical tryout, in costume, we have interviews and they're pretty extensive. We ask a lot of questions. We review applications that the lines have to fill out ahead of time. And we do go through, we read every word. We look at a student's GPA. We look at what their major is. We talk to them about what their plans are, why they want to do it. Um, and of course, in, the, in this day and age of social media and everybody with a video camera in their back pocket, we also do think about um, how responsible is this person? Do they understand the responsibility that we might be laying on their lap at their age? Uh, and so that goes through our minds as well, um, especially when you pick somebody who's an underclassman, which was the case with Zach. So um, despite all of, all of those things and being an underclassman, th there's no question in, in his tryout. It was not only the tangibles of how good he looked in the costume, but it was the intangibles as well. And coming back to looking in the costume, there's just an it factor. I don't know what to tell you, uh, Paul. You probably, if you you've come to a tryout once in a yeah. while, there's an it factor to the lion. There are plenty of students that they put the costume on and the, their GPA is great, their interview was great, they completed all the criteria. But for some reason, and this will come up when we're deliberating between, you know, the try the, the candidates. For some reason, we just say. That guy just looked like the lion. I don't know why, but he's got it. And that was the case. That was the case with Zach. So, Francis, we know now how the Nittany Lion was selected. How did he become the Mike Man? Um, well, it, it sounds a little bit like Jack. Um, I grew up in a Penn State household. Both my parents went to Penn State. They met at a Penn State function, blah, blah, blah. The whole super fan experience as a child. Um, but, you know, my freshman year, Jack's freshman year, our freshman year, Eugene was the mic man. And, uh, you know, we, we very vividly remember that Michigan game along with the rest of them um, that year. And I grew up always kind of watching the mic man and the lion, but also, you know, looking at the mic man being like, that's just an amazing job. Um, so uh, long story short, I ended up trying out for the cheer team uh, my sophomore year going into junior year uh, in hopes of maybe trying out for the backup lion uh, when the, the backup had graduated. Um, and then at that point in time, uh, I, I didn't think, you know, I put it in perspective. I was, you know, maybe five, six and 120 right. some pounds. And I had three or four friends that were like, Hey, come try out for cheerleading. And I was like, no, like, not me, no way. Uh, so eventually through my thon committee and some influence there, uh, I ended up, uh, you know, going on this bulking program, putting on 26 pounds in six weeks and trying out for the cheer team uh, wow. and getting, getting to kind of get that, that little bit of experience with the, the super fandom and, and push that forward. Um, my, my passion kind of arose from being this, like, kind of, weird student on campus that was kind of recognized at all the sporting events. I wore a, a, uh, uh, a skin suit that was half blue, half white, had a Penn State logo on the chest and had uh, wild and crazy blue and white hair. You and were that guy. Collegian, yeah, yeah. The collegian called it the blue man. Um, and so, you know, it was kind of like 
being a cheerleader was taking that that immature freshman sophomore to the next level um still had no idea what i was doing knew nothing about cheer didn't cheer any time in my life i just wanted to express my fanaticism for penn state and uh the you know that that junior year on the cheer team i got to watch jared um who was the mic man uh that year and was about to graduate and and i thought jared did such an excellent job so to put some perspective for me in college, it was Eugene and then it was Jared. So I had two excellent role models of people who were just commanding presence on the field, on the stage, and and just got everybody going at the drop of a hat. There was no question, you were psyched. So uh, then the opportunity came up to try out for that. And, um, you know, at the time we were experimenting with male cheerleaders having to do backflips. So I hadn't done a backflip. I was very scared actually of doing a backflip. And uh, we, we did a, a team tryout where a couple male cheerleaders tried out. Um, and I think we even had a female cheerleader that year uh, try out and then the team votes. Uh, and they cast their ballots quite literally on a piece of scrap paper. Um, they hand them into the coaches, the coaching staff counts them and the coaching staff gets a vote as well. Um, and I was selected on a caveat, learn how to do a backflip. You still have to make the team. So uh, I had to work very hard over the summer with a personal cheer coach at a tumbling gym uh, to get that backflip. And then coming back on campus, you know, in August for cheer camp, I had to demonstrate my ability to do the backflip and so on. So, you know, I had to get over the two, two different nerves, but um, it's basically, uh, it, it's a team decision. The coaching staff obviously has some say uh, because they need to make sure that you know, the cheer team will be represented well, as well as the university, um, because I'd say probably about a third of the events the Lion does, the Mike Man will go with him separate from the rest of the Spirit Squad. Um, just to give some context to the Lion, maybe there's a mini pep rally that has to be done. Um, but, you know, it's, it's a big group uh, vote, and it, it still is uh, to this day with Eric. Um, and, you know, I, 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 Eric was kind of like a little – a little brother almost to me. I mean that in every endearing way possible. Um, I loved watching him mature through the Mike Man uh, process and the coaching staff take him under his wing. And Eugene touched on it earlier. It was, it was what better role model to have as a coach right. than the Mike right. Man. And so you're, you're constantly around him being a sponge and you're like, tell me, tell me how I can, I can do this. Tell me how I can do this better. How can I get people more excited? That sounded weird to me. What did it sound like to you? And you know, I, I, I'm positive that I got annoying <laughs> over it, but, uh, but I, in the end, you know, it's, it comes down to the, the team votes, right. coaching staff, uh, the coaching staff has the final say, um, but, you know, it, it is a group decision for sure. So I have a couple questions for Eugene. Uh, Francis might have touched a little bit of a third rail there uh, when he said uh, even a woman tried out to be the mic man. When do you think we'll see a woman as uh, the Mike Man or potentially the Nittany Lion? I, I think it's in our near future. I mean, I definitely think it is. You know, um, we've actually had, had, you know, had Mike women, you know, do pep rallies for us. You know, when I cheered as well as me coaching as well, you know, at President's Tailgate, there have been times where we've had to have the, the actual Mike Man be at a different event. And we're like, well, you know, it's, it's their time. So they would actually do a performance at, yeah. you know, at, um, at different events and it's, it's worked out great. You know, they do a great job and um, it's just great to see something a little different. You know, you're always yeah. expecting to see that male Mike man, you know, it's a, a true blessing to see, you know, a Mike woman and they sometimes bring a better flavor every now and then, which is so great, you know, and, you know, it helps bring that be a little bit more energy because all the some of the fans just don't expect it. You know, they expect to see that Mike man there. And next thing you know, you know, you're rolling out a, a female and she's kicking butt, uh, you know, helping get that crowd going. Absolutely. Jack, you know, um, Francis was talking about learning the backflip. You had an interesting way to learn how to do backflip. Share that with the audience. Yeah. Um, so I mentioned that I taught myself to do a backflip and 
Um, I would say my ability to do one more quickly than Francis was not about athleticism, but was about um, probably not having a certain part of my brain well enough developed uh, that tells me not to take that risk. Um, but then I, I was really wanting to do it at my tryout, but never having put the lion suit on before. Um, I, I thought, how can I train for this? Um, so you have the extra weight. So I started doing backflips with a couple of coats on. Um, but then I worried about the visibility and spotting my landing if it was limited. Um, so my solution to that was blindfold myself, um, because if I can do it blindfolded in coats, uh, then I should be able to do it in the line suit. John Black, uh, you always have an interesting perspective on this. Um, what is your perspective on kind of the symbol of our best and, uh, uh, and how that position and that tradition has grown over the year? Well, I've, I just, the pride just swells up in my heart whenever I see uh, the Nittany Lion mascot or I see the Mike man out there leading the, the cheers of, uh, look, at, look at this, one of the original lions. I think this wow. is the oldest, this was before any of you other guys were ever born. And that's Lee, uh, Leo Hauk, or Leo, uh, no, no, Hugo Best, Hugo, Hugo, Hugo Best, Best. Right. Coach, and uh, we were playing a game in, uh, let's see, Yankee Stadium. And uh, that somebody dressed up in that suit with the, the long mane. Now, here, there were years, wow. when even the, uh, the typical Nittany Lion, a, 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 a mountain lion, they still put a big, heavy mane on them. And I think it may have been uh, Bobby Welsh who was the first one to get rid of that. Here, here you see the mane when. Joe Paterno was a very young coach. Uh, this goes back to my student days at Penn State uh, in the uh, late 50s and early 60s. Uh, so yeah, there've been a lot of changes in the Nittany Lion suit. The, the material that it's made out of, uh, the suits are custom made for each lion uh, as they would need to be because of the different uh, size, arm length, uh, weight, everything else. Uh, and, uh, but they sure get, the, that head is probably is heavy for, for any of them because with the helmet underneath and that's the heaviest uh, single uh, part of the suit. Uh, but it oh, just, look at, we it, got an know. appearance there. Look at that. Chuck still has his Nittany Lion head. Okay, great. <laughs> should, we, uh, should we show everyone the, the secret here? <laughs> oh, look at that. It's the helmet underneath. Okay, not everybody gets to see that, guys. Thanks for logging on tonight. Right, right. <laughs> that's what that protects is... you from having a concussion if you miss your backflip. <laughs> uh, that's correct. Yeah. Yeah, it's, it's just wonderful to see the great job that's done by these young uh, spirit leaders and, and what it brings to the crowd and what it brings to the hearts of every loyal alumnus uh, and Absolutely. alumni. Right. We are up against our time here. Uh, we right. could go on for we could go on for another couple hours. I'm sure people would love to listen to to your stories. But before we let you all go, uh, you all are doing some really great things in your careers. And uh, how Sandy Barber puts it, I think she puts it the best when she says that we're preparing our student athletes for a lifetime of impact. And and certainly as I look around the screen here. You all are doing that. So I want to give you all the opportunity to share about the impact that um, about the impact that you all are having in your professional careers now. And we'll start with you, Chuck. Yeah, so I work, uh, I work for a medical device company, uh, Boston Scientific, with pacemakers and defibrillators. It's a business job. It's medical devices. Um, it, it's also very busy because there's a, an on-call component to it. We have direct patient care. We go into the surgery and help out. And, and the lion... Be, doing the lion, like John said, the football game is a fraction. The football game is about 5%, 5% of what we do. So that position yeah. really prepared me for a very busy uh, career later in my life. Absolutely. Zach, how about you? Yeah, um, I currently work in cybersecurity consulting for Deloitte. And as with other big four consulting, like it is, it's also a lot of hours. Um, but the biggest thing that I would say that it helped me with was networking. Um, it taught me, it built my character a lot. It taught me the importance of relationships and 
yeah, the, <laughs> my interview skills went way up, <laughs> I think. Um, but yeah, overall, it, it made me a, a better person. And therefore, I, I think a better person to work with. So, <laughs> Yeah. Uh, Jack, you just went through a little bit of a career change. Talk a little bit about that. Yeah. Um, so I had a finance degree and I worked in finance for Mars, who makes M&Ms and Snickers. While I was doing that, I was coaching wrestling outside of work. Um, and it's something I found as the lion too, where there's days I'm getting up at 5 a.m. so that I can get work done, go coach wrestling. I had more energy than the days that are less packed um, that don't have that meaning. Um, I realized if that's how I felt, I wanted to dedicate my life to what my passion was, which was um, investing in, in student athletes and helping people grow. Um, so I ended up doing a pivot. I'm now at University of Massachusetts getting my MBA and a master's in sport management. That's amazing. If you Google Jack Davis, you'll find a great vision quest type photo of him coaching wrestling there in, uh, in Tennessee, uh, where he's coaching at the state championship level and had a state champion there. And it's just an epic, an epic picture of Jack uh, on the mat as a coach. Francis, how about you? Well, how do you spend your days? Um, I am in the Navy. Uh, I was in uh, Naval ROTC uh, when I was in college uh, throughout uh, the whole time, uh, all four and a half years, thanks to the Navy for allowing that extra semester of football. Um, but uh, I am now uh, stationed in Virginia Beach at uh, Naval Air Station Oceana. Uh, I fly F-18 Foxtrot uh, Super Hornets, also known as the Rhino. Um, I'm a Wizzo. Uh, and uh, it's a pretty small niche job. Uh, we are the backseat uh, drivers of the F-18. You have the pilot up front and the backseat uh, guy operating all the systems um, and the weapons. And so it, it, for, for those of you out there that have seen Top Gun, I'll make the usual pitch for the, the movie coming out uh, hopefully this summer. Hopefully they don't change the date again, but I am Goose. Um, my, my job is uh, a little bit more expanded than Goose's because it's a different airplane. Um, but at the same time, for all of you Top Gun fans out there, uh, it's, it's, uh, it is a wild ride and it's a lot of fun. Um, and uh, I, I owe, honestly, everything, everything to Penn State uh, for setting me up in the way that it has for leadership, uh, for networking. Um, and, you know, Penn State has the second largest alumni network in the Navy outside of an academy um so if you remove all the service academies the corps of cadets all that kind of stuff that feed into the navy villanova is the only school that beats our alumni network for how vast it is throughout the navy a few years back uh the penn stater magazine actually uh put, published a picture on a single carrier uh there were 22 penn staters uh, that beat the next closest alumni group on that carrier and in the entire strike group, which is a group of wow. ships, uh, by 19 from <laughs> wow. the university. So, uh, and not to include the Naval Academy, that's kind of sure, cheating. Sure, sure. But uh, Penn State uh, really reaches out into the military and sets, every, sets everyone that commissions out of Penn State up uh, fantastically to, to move forward and to excel in both a civilian and military leadership role. Uh, Eugene, I'm going to give you the last question. It's actually a two-part question. First part is um, a, lot of, a lot of fans out there think that cheer and spirit are primarily, uh, that that sport primarily happens during athletic competitions. But there's a lot that goes on um, when there aren't athletic competitions. You have nationals, you have other kinds of, of competition. So tell us a little bit about that. That's part one. And then part two is about kind of the importance of being able to travel with your, with your student athletes, with cheerleaders and, and uh, Nittany Lions and participating in alumni events and kind of touching on what Zach talked about in terms of helping them network with alumni. Yes. Yeah, so the first uh, part of the first part of the question, you know, our athletes do prepare for you know, their certain sport like nationals that happens in Orlando, Florida. So while we do prepare for our football games, our pep rallies and all those certain events, we have to also fit in their time to make a routine that is, I know it's only two minutes and 30 seconds, but 
right. a lot of it entails with you know a lot of physical skills and stunts and cheers and tumbling and um, so it's very important that we make sure we fit that time in with our practice where we're also preparing for our games and our other events so it does get a little extensive but you know we make sure we try to plan for that <clears throat> and then for that second part you know for me it's just truly important to you know travel with them only because you know it gives them an opportunity to also introduce them to the alumni association you know i always give the examples of the amazing people that i met you know i know I had Kay Salvino when she was uh, the Alumni Association president, and she actually ended up writing me recommendation letters for when I was going to grad school and job opportunities. So to have that for me, I just, it was amazing to have such, you know, a great woman, you know, hold you accountable and be able to write a beautiful recommendation for you. So I always let them know, you know, with cheerleading and always doing these events with the Alumni Association, you meet amazing people that can truly help you out in the future and you create great bonds as well and i just always try to say how important that is hey john uh, another if issue of the football letter coming out on saturday what can readers expect to see well i think uh we'll look at, at some more uh penn state football history and we'll talk about this uh event uh, here this evening and uh, look forward to next week when we have the staff of the Penn Seder magazine uh, joining us and telling us how they uh, work with within the, the sports realm uh, and uh, even even doing special issues counting down the hundred uh, best athletes in all Penn State sports which uh, created a lot of controversy and a lot of fun too. And, and Paul, I think we should finish up here saying that the Alumni Association itself has won a wonderful uh, award being named as the 2020 Renaissance Fund uh, honoree for our 150th anniversary year. And uh, we'll get more information out about that in forthcoming. Uh, uh, Absolutely. Venues, so. An unbelievable honor. We stand on the shoulders of all those who have come before us and have built this great alumni association. John Black, you've been part of that for so many years. And I know Roger Williams is on this on this call and Kay Salvino was mentioned. And I know Steve Wagman is, oh, yes. is on the call as well. And just uh, generations and generations of leaders and of Penn Staters that have built this alumni association too to where it is today. And so we're, we're so proud. John, I'm glad you brought that up tonight because we're so honored to be the Renaissance Fund honoree for 2020. Right. Well, well, that's it. Thank you guys. Thank you for joining us. Great show. Great to see all of you. I, I miss you. I wish we were uh, celebrating at a football game or before a football game together, but I know we'll all be doing that really soon. And I want to thank our audience for joining us tonight. If you're a member of the Penn State Alumni Association, thank you for your support. If you're not, what are you waiting for? Go online today and join at alumni.psu.edu and you too can become a member of the world's largest alumni association. As we are wrapping up our time this evening, uh, though we can keep the conversation going on social media, visit us on Facebook and share your favorite photos with the Nittany Lion or at events with the, with the Mike Man or maybe just a photo of you at the Lion Shrine and use the hashtag FBL Live. That's hashtag FBL Live on Facebook and the other social media channels. As John said, join us next week on Football Letter Live as we talk to the uh, Penn Stater Magazine staff and the controversial issue that they did where they attempted to rank the top 100 athletes in Penn State history. I know it didn't, it didn't come up on this show, but I know we did not rank a Nittany Lion or a Mike Man on that list. And so uh, maybe next time that comes out, uh, <laughs> we might have a spirit or cheer squad member crack that lineup. Again, thanks everybody. We appreciate you tuning in. Thanks for all you do for the university, for the glory, and for the future. We are... Penn State! Penn State.